walking through the book of Acts, and um, I've really been enjoying enjoying this series, just walking through the Bible. You know, you can learn so much just just read it, right? Not looking for a specific topic or a specific, you know, just just if you just begin to read. Yes, sir. If you read long enough, yes, sir. You will find yourself. Come on, man. In the scriptures, right. right? But not as the hero. <laughs> but we find ourselves in need of a hero. So I just thank God for going through this series. And I'm going to go ahead and just read the verses today. We'll pray and we'll get in, okay? Amen. All right. Uh, we'll pick up in Acts chapter 21. I'm going to read verses 1 through 14. Last week, uh, Pastor Terrence was in chapter 20. And just paraphrasing last Sunday, he was uh, talking from the standpoint of, of leadership, what kind of leader are you, and how we picked up on how Paul mm -hmm. had visited his last stop in Ephesus, and how he encouraged the leaders, in one instance, but also telling them what kind of leader he was to them. Yes, sir. He also warns them, now, hey, you know, it's a good chance that I'm not going to see you. And he also tells them, like, now be careful because there will be a rising of people to come teaching something different. Right. Matter of fact, he said they're already here. <laughs> and so he encourages them, warns them, and then he's about to depart. And so we pick up in Acts 21, verse 1, and he says, and this is Luke writing, and we had parted from them and set sail. Now when he parted, they were sad. They were holding on to Paul's neck. They were crying. And I mean, it was just this strong sob. But man, they loved Paul yes, sir. and Paul loved them yes. and so he's leaving it's almost kind of like if you're a parent mm. and your child decides to sign up for the military mm. and then you know they're about to go on leave now it's one thing to go on leave there's no war and it's different when there's a war and now you hug your child's neck knowing that you may not ever see them again so it was, it was kind of like that. They just didn't want to turn themselves away from Paul. So Luke says, and when we parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. Now what Paul's doing, he's basically giving you a GPS of Paul leaving Ephesus, and he's sailing towards Jerusalem. And so he's telling you about the stops that they're making. You know, Paul, known as a doctor, was very detailed in his writing, in the Gospels, even Acts. So Paul, he's pretty much no stone unturned. And he does this for a reason. And so he says, verse 2, and, and, have found, and having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, he went aboard and set sail. We went aboard and set sail. When we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre. For there the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days, and through the Spirit they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. Now notice, every t you see these stops Paul makes, and he always coming across some fellow believers. Doesn't it feel good like if you go from another city to city to city, you find fellow believers? And he says, having sought out. So they just then, they went to go look for some believers. And so they found some disciples, they stayed there, then verse 5, when our days were there were ended, we departed and went on our journey. They all with wives and children accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship and they returned home. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at, I'm going to try to pronounce this word, it starts with a P. Ptolemus, if I said it wrong, I'm sorry to all my Greek readers. <laughs> and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. Again, he goes to a new place. Guess who he runs into? Some more brothers in faith. So you can really see mm -hmm. the growth of the church at this point. Yes, sir. That's right. It was at this point, you couldn't really find a city in this region where you couldn't find some believers. Wow. And you really see Paul on his journey to Jerusalem, right? Mm -hmm. Going to Jerusalem. And now as he's backtracking, he's actually getting to see the seeds that he's planted and how the church has grown. So imagine how encouraged Paul is on his way to Jerusalem. Encouraged, like, man, I'm at this city. Man, found some church people. I'm at this city. I was here before, found some church people. So just seeing the seeds he's planted, 
for the gospel has flourished. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea. And we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven and stayed with them. And you guys remember Philip. Philip was one of the deacons chosen in Acts chapter 6 when there was a problem in the church where you had, there was some, some favoritism going on. And so they brought this problem to the disciples. And so Peter was saying, hey, you know, is, is it our job to wait on tables? Like, so let's appoint some, some men, some men of, of vow, some men of, some men of character to handle these issues. And so Philip was one of those men. That's right. But at this point, he was, he was a deacon, right? And if you read, we get to Acts chapter eight with Philip, he's actually, he ministers to a, a, a eunuch. And then he baptizes a eunuch. And if you read in Acts 39 through 40, then after he baptizes a eunuch, the Holy Spirit literally teleports Philip to this place called Sisera. That's kind of weird back then. You know, you know, I grew up watching Star Trek. My dad loved Star Trek. So, you know, they go into the thing, Captain Kirk, you know, he can get caught up in some planet, get in trouble and hit, flip the thing and, you know, beam me up, right? Beam me up, Scotty. So you literally had Philip, he baptizes this eunuch, right? And as a eunuch comes up, the Bible says immediately right. the Holy Spirit transports him, removes him, and puts him in this place called Caesarea. That's right. And from that point on, he spent his time there evangelizing the city. So now they call him Philip the Evangelist. All right. Good teaching, man. So think about when you walk with God, you go through these different, it's kind of like a little side note, you go through these different changes. That's right. To where God may call you in one particular position That's right. in one point of your life, but then he begins to transition you to something else. That's right. So he started as Philip as the deacon. Now he's Philip the evangelist. <laughs> Amen? Yes, sir. That's a little side note. This a little, little tidbit. And so he said he had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. Okay? Now I want to stick there for a second. This is not the crux of my message. But one thing that really hit me, and, and Pastor T said a little bit last Sunday, uh, uh, with our children, uh, can't remember all in detail, but it hit me to where they talk about Philip the evangelist, right? Then notice it says his daughters, now it's funny to say they was unmarried who, who prophesied. I don't know if the prophecy keep them from being married. I don't know. It just said they was unmarried. I, they put their business out there like that. I don't know why they put that, but they was unmarried who prophesied. Maybe they just saw every man and they knew his intentions and so they, I don't know. But, <laughs> They were married. Thank you, Lord. But what I love about this is that it what struck me, what I got from it, and this is where I'm at in life, and I think all us parents, as when we have children, is that by nature we focus on uh, their natural abilities, their natural gifts. We'll make sure that they're in the right school. We'll make sure that they're educated. They have a gift. It may be for music or sport or art, whatever it is. And we get so honed in on cultivating those gifts, which nothing is wrong with that. But we got to remember, too, that our kids are also a spirit. And they have spiritual gifts. And so you see here with Philip, he has four daughters. And I, I truly believe that he cultivated with his wife the spiritual gifts of his daughters. And that gift happened to be probably the gift of prophecy. That's good. And so I think as parents, we gotta be very mindful. I'm not saying you get so spiritual that your kids just don't want anything to do with God. But what I am saying, the energy we put in their, their natural abilities, yeah. their intellectual abilities, yeah. we have to invest in their spiritual gifts as well. That's Amen? Good. That's good, brother. Amen. Verse 10. How long God, I forgot to put on my timer. Okay, I got my thing right there. That makes sense. Okay. So it says, while we're staying, we were, while we were staying there for many days, verse 10, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, this is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard this, we and the people, they urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I am ready not only to be in prison, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And look at verse 14. And since he would not be persuaded, 
we ceased mm. and said, let the will of the Lord be done. So I want to use as today's title, the Lord's will be done. All right. The Lord's will be done. Yeah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you just for this gathering. Thank you, God, for just allowing us to, to be in your presence, to open up your holy word. Mm -hmm. I pray, God, that you speak through me, that I'm just a mere vessel. I pray I decrease as you increase. I pray that you word in my mouth. I pray you open our ears and soften our hearts to receive the word for the day. Yes. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The Lord's will be done. Right. Man, that is... This word will, right? Like we all have a will, right? We all have a will. And it's this battle that we have of our will and God's will. And it really starts, we can start from Genesis, from the time they were in, in, in the garden, where you already see the clash of wills. That's right. Matter of fact, we can go before the garden, you see the clash of wills in the heavenly places between God and Satan. So even in the angelical beings had this issue with the will and God's will. And so you see it, it, it spills over into the garden with man and God. And we can go there, but to make it simplistic, let's just, let's bring it home to the day with our will. Yes. You know, being a parent, you know, first being a kid, you being a teenager, you know, when, you, when, you, when you, you're a baby, you know, your parents' will is like this. And your will is just a little bitty, little pebble, right? And so when you're young, your parents, whenever they speak, yeah. you know, it's, it's strong will. Yeah. And you, know, you, 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 you submit to it a lot easier. Uh -huh. But as you begin to get older, your will becomes a little bit stronger. Yeah. And so now as you get older, now this friction takes place because you're battling with your will and your parents' will. So you get around about 13, 14, them teenage years, to where now there's this, this friction that starts to take place. And so now what mom and dad said was absolute starts to become kind of gray. What mom and dad seemed very wise on seems to become kind of foolish. And so because that will is becoming strong. And so now being as a parent now, because I was the 13, 14, 15 year old, I got to remind myself I was 13, 14, and I remember how my will was. But then I can pull from the examples of my parents' will <laughs> and draw from that to see how they will still was done. <laughs> is, it, is, is it making sense? At the end of the day, no matter how much I want to, my will, when I look back over my life, you know what? Mom and daddy still, they will was still done. Well, how do I know that? Well, because I'm still standing here. Because at some point, what they poured in, what they planted in me, it, it, it's, it's, still, it's still here. And so now we take that just from a natural standpoint to our will, and then we, we ask the question, what is the Lord's will? Woo, boy. The Lord's will, man, is... Is it's I don't know. It's, it's it. I, sometimes it's confusing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's it's frustrating. Sometimes it's uplifting. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's very encouraging. Sometimes it's discouraging. I'm gonna be real about it. I'm I'm human. And so I look at the Lord's will. One of the most asked questions in Christian faith is what is God's will? There are many scriptures that we can find that shows. God's manifest, manif manifesting many aspects of his will, but yet many still wonder, what is his will? I believe the question arises because we desire to know the will for our lives much more than what is the will of the Lord. We indirectly express that when, we, when our primary focus is, what is God's will for my life, for my career, my marriage, my children, ministry, my health, my finances, etc. But you notice the common denominator in these examples is the word my. <laughs> or better yet translated, me or I. See, we must remove our will 
so that we may see these three things that I'm going to point out today. And I'm going to show you how I bring it home even with Paul. And so three things we'll look at today is the Lord's will revealed in Christ. All right. Come on now. Because God, God, he does reveal his will. Yes, he does. It's revealed in Christ. Amen. How do I know? Because Paul pins it in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 through 12. And I'm going to read those. You want to go to it? If not, take notes. And if I get too deep today, that's what Wednesday night Bible study is for. All right. Plug. All right. Thank you. <laughs> So in Ephesians chapter five, chapter one, verse five, Paul says, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. Amen. That's why we just did communion. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. Now look at verse 9 and 10. Now this is what's going to come home. Now you should shout on this. God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ. All right which is to fulfill his own good plan. Oh, man. That's a good word. Let me say that again. <laughs> if you're confused about the Lord's will. Come on, man. Come on. God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ. Mm. See, this Christ thing was a mystery. Yes, sir. See, he was prophesied about for thousands of years. Yes, sir. And so when he shows up, it's still a mystery. And so Paul says, the mystery of God's will has been revealed. Mm -hmm. It is to fulfill his own good plan. Oh. Well, what is his good plan? Read verse 10. <laughs> and this is the plan. <laughs> At the right time, yes. he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, yes. everything in heaven and on earth. Right. It's very clear. Right, but he, he just said this was here was the mystery of Christ. Okay, this was my the, the mysterious will was Christ was here to fulfill my own good plan. This is this God talking, and here is the plan. Yes, because you had I wish I had I forgot demonstrations, but you had let's say here's heaven, right, and here's earth. Okay, so you had a union between heaven and earth. That's why, well, that's why when, when Jesus said, we pray, thy will be done, right. right, on heaven as it is in earth. So before the fall, you had heaven, you had earth. This is a bad example, but I don't have any props, so I'm going to use this right here. Okay, my fist. Okay? And so there was an alignment with heaven and earth. The Bible said that God would come in the cool of the day right. and walk with man. That's right. It was total access. Mm -hmm. There was no sin. Everything was perfect. There was, there was a, a, a strong relationship. Sin crept sin, it's fractured. That's right. So now you have the communion with earth and heaven has been fractured because of sin. So now there's a breakage. Okay, there's a fracture. Now it wasn't totally broken. Okay, there's, there's a fracture. Right? And so what God's ultimate plan was through Christ mm -hmm. is to reconcile, restore the relationship between heaven and earth. Is everybody with me? Yes, sir. Because we've been taught somehow. I'm going to get to Paul in a second. i got to break this God's will down for you because you'll never, you won't understand God's will when they say that with Paul until you understand the Lord's will first. Come on, man. Because we've been taught that when we die, we focus on going to heaven. Mm -hmm. When God made man, he didn't put him in heaven. He put him on earth. And so why is that? Because man was meant to be on earth. So God just wants to reconcile heaven back with earth so man can be a representation of God in heaven on earth. Right. So it's about reconciliation, bringing things back to what they used to be. Amen. That's why when John said, I see a new heaven and a new earth. So if it was meant for us to be in heaven, he would have put us in heaven from the get. On, no, we was meant to be put on earth because earth was the representation of heaven. So now guys, I got to reconcile all this back together for a new heaven, new earth, put man back in earth in his rightful place where he's supposed to be to have that reconcil reconciliation back like from the beginning. Amen. Everybody see that? Good teaching. Good teaching. That's the will of the Lord. Reconciliation with him and man. Amen. Right? Because yeah. that's how it was from the beginning. 
and he does this through Christ. So that's the master plan. Yeah. Were you with me? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Now, I had to get that out the way. It's good. The second thing I want us to focus on is mm -hmm. the Lord's will revealed to his children. Right. So now you have the Lord's ultimate plan, right? But then now there is his will for us in our lives to fit his plan. So it's not like God has a plan for your life. No, it should be more so of, no, God has a will for you to be part of his plan. Mm. Are you with me? Yes, because we all play a part. We all fit. If, if, if I want to use the term like a movie, we all play a role. Yeah. Everybody can't beat Denzel. <laughs> Everybody can't be the lead role. Uh -huh. Sometimes you just got to be the guy that died in the credits. But at least you was in the movie. You with me? Yes, sir. You know, you know how this might get excited. I'm on TV. Damn, I'm in the movie. What movie? But just wait just a second. You're going to just, just, just watch. Pause it right there. That's me right there. You see me? I'm the dude that's watching the grass behind the car over there. Right there. But I'm in there. But I'm in the movie. But we live this life because of our will. A lot of times we don't want to receive the part that we play in the big picture. That's a good word. We should rejoice, man, at least I'm a part of the plan. Yes, sir. Oh, come on, somebody. All right. And so Paul understood this. So what I like about God, what I love about God is God is very transparent. Notice with his children. See, as a parent, we reveal our will to our children. All the real might reveal to, to, your, to your children or to your, to your children. There's a, there's a will, there's a plan for my family that my kids know this is the plan. And I'm very transparent about that plan. Mm -hmm. And the plan will be executed. Okay. <laughs> By will be done. By will be done. <laughs> right? And so we look at Paul. The, Lord, the Lord's will revealed to us. We look at Paul. And actually, if you go in Paul's conversion in Acts chapter 9, because just the start was, was about to happen in Jerusalem. You got to go out this conversion. I think Pastor talked about it before. Well, Paul is converted, and he tells him to go to Ananias. God talks to Ananias, and I was like, now you do know he killing Jews. Like, like he's our arch enemy. But then God tells Ananias in verse 15, he says, but the Lord said, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel. That's right. Oh, let's get to 16, because we skipped that. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my namesake. Amen. It's in there. So God has just revealed his will for Paul, who's a part of the master plan. His will for Paul was to go take the gospel to the Jews, mm -hmm. to the Gentiles, and to kings. Mm. And then Paul's about to head to Jerusalem because mm -hmm. he's going to be handed over by the Jews to the Gentiles. But he's going to spend the last few years of his, 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 his time on earth before kings, men of influence, That's right. giving them the gospel. Yes, sir. So God's will is being done in the life of Paul. That's good, man. That's good. Because from the time he started, he, we, we read it. God, he'd been beaten, thrown out the city. People had to come and mend his wounds. You okay, brother? I know you hit you upside your head. We're going to get that knocked down for you. He'd have been through all, been thrown in jail. Yep. So he's been, he's, been, he's been experiencing verse 16. Yes. He's been experienced in verse 15, but now Paul is coming to Jerusalem because it's at the hand of the Jews that he's going to be passed over before people of influence, these kings. And you're going to see, well, I'm pretty sure who's up preaching next is going to cover all that. But now this is it's about to be the climax mm -hmm. of Paul's life before he gets out of here. But Paul wasn't caught off guard about what's going to happen in Jerusalem because if you go and read, the Holy Spirit reve reveals to Paul what he's going to endure in Acts chapter 20. Paul says in 22, and now I am bound, talked about last week, by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem. That's right. I am convinced. I am, the Holy Spirit is telling me, man, yeah. go to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me, what he says, except the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city yeah. that jail and suffering lie hid. Now that's kind of like, I don't know if oxymoron, kind of confusing, because notice he just says, I don't know what, the, what waits me, but then he says what the Holy Spirit says, I'm about to be going to jail. Mm. 
Now, maybe he could say, I don't know what the waste in the sense of, will this be the end? Because he's, he's done jail, right? That's nothing new to Paul. Paul had I always had some of his commissary books. It wasn't new to Paul. He was, he was you know, he's that dude that's in jail that's used to being in jail. It wasn't new, nothing new to him. Don't lock me up, throw away the key. It's my second home. So it, it wasn't that, but he, when he said, awaits me, and this is just me, just my interpretation. Don't take that as the gospel. I think maybe Paul, from this standpoint, now it's, 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 it's kind of gray. Maybe this is the time where I don't return. Maybe this, this is the moment where it won't be no, we singing and the, and the, jail, the jail gates open and the ground shake. This, right. this, this may be it. Because he says, I don't know what awaits me, but what I do know yes. is I'm, 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 about to, I'm about to go deal with some suffering. Yeah. And so Paul was securing that. He, was, he, he understood, man, this is the will of the Lord because the Holy Spirit has, has confined me and bound me and just, and just pretty much brought out, told me, you're going to Jerusalem. And he submitted to that. How many times has, when God begins to reveal in our lives, yeah, this one right here, this is the one you're gonna have to go through. You can pray, you can fast, you can call on the saints, but this one right here, it's just me and you. Mm. How many times and when, when God begins, because God is very transparent with his children, when he says, you know what, this it's gonna be a tough one. This is gonna be a tough one. Is it, or do, do, we, do we cling to him? Do we respond like Paul, I'm bound by it? Or do we try to wrestle out the Holy Spirit? Let me, I'm no longer bound, I'm not going. Paul has experienced up until this point, jail, hunger, shipwreck, beaten, all for the gospel. And truth be told, at the hands of all three groups that God called him to go to. That's right. The Jews at some point beat him, threw him in jail. The Gentiles at some point beat him, threw him in jail. And now he's about to go before kings who have the power to, beat, to, to behead you. That's right. So at the same time, when Paul is going back to Jerusalem, from Ephesus, he's seeing how the church has blown up. Man, the church has grown. So in that instance, he's seen the fruit of the labors of ministry where the church has grown. Amen. But he's also seen the other part of the ministry, which has caused him to be beaten, to be ostracized, to be rejected. See, one thing about God, and this is what I'm learning in my life, is God is 100% everything. What do you mean by that, Pastor Mike? He's not sometimes angry. He's not sometimes loving. He's not sometimes righteous. He's not sometimes forgiving. He puts the same energy in all aspects of who he is. Does, does, it, does it make sense? Yes, sir. He's not just, he, he, he encompasses all of it because he's righteous. He's the only one that can do that. Like, I can only be sometimes happy and sometimes angry. I don't, have the, I don't have the capacity to put all my energy in all of it at the same time because now I'd be strapped up in the, one of them jackets and be locked up because mm -hmm. I'm not God. Mm -hmm. And you would think I was crazy, but he was just happy, but now he mad, but now he angry. Now he passing something, now he taking stuff. Like, what is wrong with this brother? But only God can operate in all aspects at the same time. What we've done, we've, um, what I'm looking for, we've, we've, we've put God in, a, in, a, in slices. Mm -hmm. He's percent of this, he's percent that, when he's all of it at the same time. And he does it because his will is done effectively because he's all that at the same time. That's why he leaves no stone unturned. Yeah. And so what I, even in our very lives, can we be like Paul? We say, well, you know what? That's Mike, you know, that's Paul. Well, let me tell you something. Jesus ran through the same conundrum. Because if you look at the life of Jesus, he would constantly say, I'm here to do, do the will of who? The Father, right? Sounded good, right? Yeah. The will of the Father. Go read that Garden of Gethsemane. <laughs> Go back and read that. Mm -hmm. What did he say? Now, because now humanity. So now, now, now he's really wrestling with the flesh. That's right. Now, now the flesh is like, wait a minute. Now I'm, I'm about to take hit. Now ain't nobody touched me for 30, 33 years. Mm. Now there's moments where you've transported me out of trouble. Mm -hmm. Remember the one story where they wanted to stone Jesus, and in the moment he just walked about. They didn't know he was. He disappeared. <laughs> yeah. That's right. But now. He's in the garden, and now there's a battle of, 
Not that Christ was being disobedient, but now the flesh, the flesh is like, no, no, it sounded good, slain before the foundation of the world. That's good penmanship. But no, but he said, no, but not thy will, your will be done. And if the perfect of all perfects was in the garden and allowed us to read that the flesh was, was trying to rise up in its will, number one, we can assure that we're not exempt from it. That's right. Number two, we can rejoice that we can overcome it. Amen. So it's twofold. And so we see Paul's response is that God has all revealed to Paul what's going to happen. Okay, now, you may say, well, how do I apply that, Pastor Mike? Sound good, but I need to have everyday, everyday life. It's real simple. The Lord's will should be received with submission. It's the only application I have for you. There ain't no five, six points. It's just real simple. Just submit to it. But why? Because it will be done. That sounds unfair. How is a God, a loving God, just going to override my will? Well, when we read in Ephesians, those who are in Christ, you know, we gave up our will. That's right. For the will of the Father. Amen. Because our will is why where we're at today before we met him. Amen. Our will is what caused all this thing to go chaotic That's right. from the garden. So the record has shown that our will is pretty unsuccessful. <laughs> there is no success rate when it comes to the will of man. Amen. Oh, you don't believe me? Okay, well, let's take the best of the best real quick. Well, let's look at Abe. We started with, with Adam. Well, that stopped there. Well, look at Noah. He did the will of the Lord, but before he could even rejoice, he got drunk. <laughs> look at Abraham, the will of the God. Well, well, he lied about Sarah. Mm -hmm. See, all these flaws and people who had problems at some point yielding to God's will. But yet they put their trust in him. Mm -hmm. And notice every time they submit it, to God's will, That's right. you saw the great things that God did through them. Amen. Amen. When God reveals the role that we have within his will, we are called to respond with the heart of a servant. Submitting is not a natural response within our human nature, especially when it seems that we are the ones that have to give up something we deem valuable. Mm -hmm. Let me stop there. God will not require you of something that's not valuable to you. It's a good word, man. We all value different things. When the rich man showed up, Jesus had a problem with the rich man having money. That's right. That was not the issue. The, the issue. problem was like, you got all your hope in your money. That's right. Get that up. Nah. Come follow me. <laughs> nah, pass. Matter of fact, the Bible said the man even left dejected. Yeah. That's right. Because yeah. he done all these things yeah. and thought he, that was it. And God's like, no, you did all but one thing you ain't checked off. Mm. Is that money your God? Or maybe it's a career that we had dreams of being in. Like, no, as a matter of fact, I want you to get that up mm. and follow me. Mm. So we all have things that we value. Every last one of us. That's good, man. And what I've learned is that when God comes to challenge our will, he's going to require the very thing that we value. It's a requirement. It's not a suggestion. It's like a prerequisite. Hmm. Remember the college course? You got to take this before you take that, that class, which I never understood that. Just give me that class. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it's, it's a requirement. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's, it's a command. Let me just go ahead and just say it. It's a command. Amen. And so when we give that up, it says God even used the gift of prophecy to warn Paul of what awaited him in Jerusalem. Yeah, it prophesied to him, even where he may stop. Listen, man, the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. So there's nothing wrong with prophecy. I don't want to spend too much time on that. Uh, prophecy is a spiritual gift. That's right. yeah. And it is a gift that is still active today. Yes, it is. Now, some people believe, only have heard the sensation, they believe certain gifts in the, not don't go on today. I don't really pres prescribe to that. You know, that's, that's not my mentality. But I do know that the gift of prophecy is still prevalent today. Yes, and we can allow people who abuse it make us minimize its importance. That's right. It's still important. Amen. Because all it does is just proclaim what God has already said. Yeah. That's right. And when you get to like personal prophecy, let me just a little side note. If someone gives you a, a, a personal prophecy, okay, what it should do is just re-confirm re, re, what God has already spoken to you about. That's right. 
So if God had spoken to you about it, don't be a jerk about it. You know, be like, oh, get out of my face, old fake prophet. You, know, you don't do that. You know, the Bible said don't despise all prophets. So you hear it, receive it, put it on the shelf. Okay, then if it comes to fruition, okay, if it doesn't, you keep on moving. So they were prophesying to Paul the will of God. All they were doing was confirming to Paul what God had already told them. That's good, man. Now, here's the problem to come to human, human uh, application. Because they love Paul so much mm -hmm. that their implication or their application of it was a sense of a warning to deter him to go into Jerusalem. That's it, man. But Paul looked at it as not as a warning, but preparation of what awaited him. That's good, man. That's good teaching. Yes, Are you with me? Yes, sir. So certain things, if God, somebody comes speaking to your life about, you know, God has already confirmed it. It's just, now they may say, you know, this is what the Lord showed me, and this is what I think you are. See, once I say this is what I think, I don't need you to think. <laughs> I stop when you get to that I think part. That's right. You're just confirming what God has already told me. Amen. Now, you might understand what you just told me, what God showed you, but he's already spoke to me about it. Because notice Paul in 20 said that I'm bound by the Holy Spirit to do what? to go to Jerusalem. And he said, when I, on my way, there's gonna be some suffering, I'm gonna go through some things, and so now the Holy Spirit starts to, start to become activated in the body of believers as Paul is making his way to Jerusalem. So Paul looks at it like this, okay, you're just confirming. I'm pretty sure by the time Paul got tired of hearing it, all right, man, I know, man, I know, man, I know, man, like I know. My bad, sorry, right But you could tell Paul response in it. And so he says, the request to turn back from his peers seemed logical and understandable, but it wasn't from God. See, they loved Paul. I mean, Paul was a major player in the gospel. They loved Paul. And so like, man, Paul, we love you. Man, don't go. Now, them telling him what awaited was of God, them telling him don't go was more human, their relationship. Does, does it make sense? And so Paul was so bound by the Holy Spirit that he didn't allow the good intentions of his peers to stop him from submitting to the will of God. So sometimes we can have good intentions, but it's not God's will. We can have good motives, but it's not God's will. We can have just a, 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 a good idea of just a, a heart for something or for someone, but it's not God's will. And Paul's response tells you that when he says, and look at his response. And I'm almost out of here. Then Paul answered, what are you doing? Weeping, You're breaking my heart. For I am ready not only to be in prison, been there, done that, but I'm even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Now this is where you see verse 14. That's why you gotta surround yourself with people who understand God's will. Because look how they responded in verse 14. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. They weren't trying to keep convincing him. Come on, Paul, listen to us, man. We're trying to help you, man. You fool, we're trying to save your life. Come on, Paul. None of that. It wasn't, oh, well, I know what the Lord showed me, Paul, about your life, and I know I'm a prophet, and you need to listen to what, what God told me about. They didn't do that. What they did was be the friend that Paul needed. Yes. And they realized that this man is bound by the Holy Spirit to go. That. He's so bound, nothing that we could do or say is going to change his mind. So therefore... Lord's will be done. And they prayed for him. They supported him because they understood that the Lord's will will be done. And I, I don't really know. I'm not one of the guys that try to tell, you know, I'm not one of those guys that say, man, what the Lord wants to do in your life. The Lord, I, I, that, that's just, that's not my gift, I guess, so to speak. I'm, I'm not one of those guys. What I am is that what I do understand is that the big picture of God's will is reconciling him and humanity. And the role we play in that picture is based on according to his will. And we should submit to that. And if his will is for me to be the dude in the movie, widen the plant behind that SUV, 
and you only see the top of my head, then I'm going to rejoice because I'm in the movie. I was part of the plan. David said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in heaven. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in heaven than rule in hell. If it's the Lord's will for growing faith to expand, it's the Lord's will. If it's the Lord's will for growing faith, stay right here. It's the Lord's will. If it's the Lord's will for my life to, to, to be at a, a certain economical status the day I die, it's the Lord's will. If it's the Lord's will for me to be one of the most wealthy, if it's the Lord's will, the Lord's will be done. And the, the quicker, the more we submit, and listen guys, it's a, it's, it's a daily process. It's not a one-time thing. It's not like, oh, I submitted, I'm good. No, it's a daily thing of constantly submitting to God's will. You know why? Because heaven and earth hasn't fully reconciled yet. Once it reconciles, Smith's will will become second nature. Amen? And I'm going to close this. I don't know who today, maybe somebody watching, that all I can say is if you're not in Christ, you will find nothing but frustration. You'd find your life being incomplete. Because as long as you try to live your life according to your will, you'll never have hope true hope, you'll never have true joy, you'll never have true purpose. The worst thing you do is, is be a part of something and I know what your role is. And so I just encourage you today that to be part of the family, submit your life to Christ, it's real simple. You just confess your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and he rose on the third day, he died for your sins and at that moment, if you just submit yourself to Christ, you're in the family of God. And not only that, if you do that, I would challenge you to find a group of believers, find a church, find someone where you can just, you can get in to be fed and get that cultivated. Amen.